WHO Europe European program of work. This will be announced during the nearest uh, session of um, WHO Europe. Uh, it will be, I think, on 15th of um, on 15th of September. And Amy is joining sort of this program from the perspective because generally, of course, uh, leave no one behind means leaving no one behind regarding the healthcare and so on. But we are joining this program uh, with understanding leaving no one behind in medical education, health professional education and training. So we, we need to have the same chance also in this. So we are very happy to, uh, to start working really intensely with WHO. Philippa, do we have one hour for this session just to verify it? Yes, exactly. We have an hour. We don't have a, a, anything scheduled afterwards, so it's not um, very... Um, yeah, but I, I don't worry. I want, yes. it, it will not change, turn into two hours, don't worry. So I think you may start, uh, you, you may start and uh, if anyone joins a little bit later, that's, that's okay. Yes, exactly. So um, let me give you a formal, um, formal introduction to our guest speaker today, which is uh, Janusz Janczukowicz. <laughs> Please, I tried my best. This is always uh, a challenge, I know. He is an MD, PhD and a Master of Medical Education and Professor at the University of Lodz. He is the Head of Center of Medical Education there and a Vice Dean for Development and Education and, of course, He's also been part of the AMI Executive Board, uh, Executive Committee in the past years, and has always been a strong uh, defender of uh, student involvement in the board. And so we are always happy to work together with him. And today we wanted him and asked him to speak about um, challenges students are facing uh, nowadays uh, and um, healthcare professionals during clinical practice. So professionalism being uh, the most important part, but also in interprofessional collaborative uh, settings uh, and how to go on about being an educator and a clinician. So um, a lot of you maybe know as uh, clinician scientist programs, well, it's kind of clinician educator. And uh, also to talk about the necessary skill set to uh, be a teacher in today's healthcare setting. Um, so yes, uh, I will give on the word for Janusz and um, you can maybe decide whether you want to take questions directly or in the end and then we will see. Tomorrow. Okay, so thank you for this introduction and, and really, I'm really happy to be with you again. And uh, I not only appreciate that, that you invite me quite often for different webinars and I already got emails before this webinar. Yes, we know each other from Taiwan or from other sessions. This is really great, but I, I think I even more appreciate the choice of subjects because you usually ask me to speak about interprofessional education, professionalism, cultural competence, and these are the things that are really, really important at the moment. Um, I think I would just maybe, I will try to speak for about 30 minutes uh, and then we'll have 30 minutes of open discussion if anyone wants to stay for longer. Um, of course, I even at the moment, I can see the questions you posted, uh, but um, I mean, you sent me before, but still I want to make sort of introduction to medical and academic professionalism. Guys, I already know that you are from very diverse countries. I have two more questions. Do we have any students who are not medical students, but just health profession students? Could you type on chat? If there are any students who are maybe nursing students, paramedics, or we are doctors here. Okay, I, I well, I'm, I'm very happy to work with doctors. As, as you could hear, I'm a doctor, but I, I hope it will change and we'll have more and more inclusive uh, community of students uh, every year. And you will understand the reason I'm asking you this question. And the second question is, could you please uh, don't, be ashamed to say no. Could you type on chat very quickly, yes or no, if you have if you have at your school, at your university, a formal program of pro, on professionalism. If if you have any course that is called medical professionalism. Okay. 
Okay. So, okay, you see, I think majority of people say no. Uh, from this moment, I will start sharing screen. And uh, can I ask just Philippa, if there is any really urgent question on chat or anything you should tell me, like you don't hear me or, or there's something important, please tell me because I will stop seeing chat window, okay? Yes, I will uh, notify you. So, uh, guys, I, I want you to understand that talking for one hour about professionalism, it's a little bit similar to if you invite me to give you like a one hour lecture on internal medicine or one like uh, hour lecture on, on surgery. So it's, I was really going through hundreds of presentations, lectures, and, and this is what I chose, okay? This is what I chose to, uh, to start the conversation with you. Uh, can you see my screen at the moment? Positive. And can you see just the proper screen or you can see the presenter's screen because it's... The presenter's screen. Okay, so I need to check it somehow. Swap, duplicate, slideshow. Is it okay now? Perfect. Okay, so now I need to go to the first slide. So guys, this is, this is the drawing you can see here. It's one of the drawings made by our students. This is an, just assignment. Our students um, complete during the course showing how our students see the complexities and uh, the development of their academic professionalism and medical professionalism. Um, and I will tell you about our courses a little bit. Sorry, this is what I wanted to avoid and I really don't know how. Uh, I was just doing my best to turn off. Uh, uh, okay, I think I need to uh, okay, let's see, maybe there will be no more, just wait a moment. <laughs> uh, so, um, so guys, this is our school. This is, uh, this is uh, my, our main teaching hospital. And uh, as our school, as our city is the city of murals. Uh, so our university have also many murals, so feel invited, we'll show you everything. And we have a huge population uh, community of international students. We are not sure how it will look like this year, academic year, how many of them will be able to come back uh, to Poland. But what we know is that we have a few thousand, uh, no, about one and a half thousand of international students. So look, historically, uh, we have uh, medical profession, developed from healers, from ancient healers, from ancient doctors. And uh, usually I will show you this slide for a minute and we start our courses on professionalism from discussing those two pictures, these two pictures, and asking students to identify the differences uh, in care. And of course, the first impression is that on the right, we, we have what we really need, the super modern, uh, medical equipment. But then we start, we ask students, could you tell us, do you see any advantages on the left? And at first they say, well, there is no hygiene, there is no knowledge and so on and so on. But then they start saying, okay, but they are all sitting together and they are all, um, and they are all feeling safe and they respect each other. And then we start realizing that on this long way from ancient healers to contemporary doctors, we have lost some very important values. So now don't worry, this slide, this will be the only really serious slide for this, uh, for this uh, mm, webinar. Uh, I, again, I will not ask you this question, I will just explain you. From our perspective, people who deal with professionalism, we see a difference between an occupation, a job and profession because profession, first of all, requires a lot of knowledge and skills. Then it's used in the service of others. Then the profession as a group of professional people needs to have own code of ethics. So now you can already see doctors, teachers, lawyers, architects, uh, and then there is something you, you, you might never heard about. It's so-called social contract. What does it mean social contract? It means that through the ages, doctors were helping people 
in the best possible way and in return uh, the societies granted them very specific privileges first of all the monopoly over the use of our knowledge look you may uh, if you speak english you may start teaching english you may be a very poor english teacher but no one will tell you you are not allowed to teach english but you are and you may make a lot of the other courses but you may not practice medicine without having a license to practice only doctors can help people from the medical perspective this is a huge privilege of course the main aim is the patient safety but from another perspective we are forming a very specific group that has a huge privilege to provide people with uh, care uh, we have a huge autonomy usually doctors are deciding about themselves we have our own professional bodies that decide what is good and what is what is proper what is professional what is not professional and we call it self-regulation uh, so we are responsible for the society for all of this and now why do i show you such a let's call it a dry slide because you will realize that we have unfortunately problems with multiple elements of what is presented here so um can you type on chat maybe can i ask i would just for a moment stop screen sharing can you type on chat one imagine about the, what does it mean for you a good doctor but i mean even not the doctor that you want to be imagine a doctor for your maybe future children or current children for your beloved person for your mom one feature how do you want this doctor to be it may be an adjective it may be competent responsible truthful good communicator wow that's really nice this is second time competent actually that's interesting and we do a lot of that kind of um uh supportive compassionate culturally humble and professional that's a nice set thoughtful okay so uh and now tell me with all respect to all our schools of this list how many of these features do you get good training at your school in how many features okay so uh <laughs> so as for now silence and this is not that you are from good schools this is that you listed a lot of features which are extremely important but at the same time we are quite new in teaching this and for in majority of cases we admit that we are not really perfect in teaching uh, all these features so back to back to the presentation uh, so you see this is something that it's easy to say this doctor is not professional but if i ask you to define professionalism this becomes much more difficult and for my school uh, we have adopted this very well known definition of professionalism which says that these are all values behaviors relationship that underpin the trust the people have in doctors so you see the word trust is extremely important and we know that patients that trust their doctors have better results of treatment and this is not only that they feel better mentally no we can i can give you um, publications that describe very measurable outcomes like for example levels of glucose in blood in patients with diabetes if they trust doctors there is there there is a long explanation why their results of treatment are better so historically you may not know why this picture is here this is the very very old from 70s the tv or maybe 80s a tv series about old american um, um doctor I, I mean old times in america about the female doctor and her struggles with everyday life and uh, to be honest I think we may say that her life from multiple perspective was easier. I mean, she was now we are surrounded with legal regulations, internet, pharmaceutical companies, a, a lot of documents, globalization, research, and this makes 
explaining what professional doctor is uh, much more difficult. And in 1960s and 70s, people started complaining. People mostly in USA, in the UK, people started saying doctors are no more professional. They use the benefits of the privileges of profession to promote, promote own benefits, to promote own uh, incomes. This is the same slide you could see, but this is what I want to tell you is people started saying that what is in red, social contract, monopoly, autonomy, doctors stopped using this to help people. They started using it to earn a lot of money and to keep everything within the profession. And even in Polish, we have such a proverb that it's a bad bird that makes own nest dirty. And what is the interpretation of this? That there was a very long time when doctors were trying to keep hidden all the medical errors. And it was absolutely unacceptable for a doctor to publicly criticize another doctor. So it was not about this patient's safety. It was about the doctor's safety. Even if patients were in risk, it was unacceptable to tell my colleague is addicted to alcohol because everyone would tell you, how can you tell it in public? You are the member of the profession. We are just one group. And people started saying, no, we don't agree with, them, with uh, that kind of approach. Uh, what happened on just uh, between 20th and 21st century, um, one of seemingly very good family doctors in UK was identified as a serial killer who killed more than 250 people. And while you might say, okay, so serial killers will appear from time to time, perhaps in every profession. Yes, but the problem was that medical profession didn't identify it. And one of the reasons was that people didn't want to criticize the other people. That uh, what is at the moment fundamental, I'm not sure how much you have this feeling that you are responsible not only for your own patients. If you are working at the hospital and you see that your colleague has no skills or knowledge, maybe has problems, maybe is ill, maybe is addicted, and this person's patients are in risk, you are responsible also for the other patients. And no one was reacting after he was, after Schickman was, uh, after, it was this, after it was discovered that he was a serial killer, then people started saying, oh yes, really, he had many problems and I could see this and I could see this. And again, people said, uh, no, we don't want that kind of medical profession that allows someone to kill 250 patients. So there are people who are trying to somehow keep the image. And they were saying that one single bad apple doesn't indicate a bad orchard. Okay, but it was not one single bad apple. It was just a very striking example. So the first reaction to this, we call it, um, um, there is such a story about uh, prodigal son or forgiving father when the son was a sinner, but came back to father and said, please forgive me. So we call it nostalgic professionalism. When you know those old professors started meeting and they were saying, we need to be back to old values. We need to be back how it was in the past. But the problem is that the past is the past, not the present. So it was not working. And uh, you may know these features of uh, professionalism from, for example, Hippocratic Oath, honesty, responsibility, honor, altruism, but in, okay, they are all very proper, but they do not translate easily to today's word. Please note, no one, uh, when you are listing features of uh, ideal doctor, you didn't say honor or altruism. It's not because you don't respect such features, but just you are listing very practical features, competent, communicative, respectful, empathetic, and so on and so on. So this shows that this, shift back to previous values is not working currently. And uh, I could, uh, mm, I, I'm showing you uh, also similar statements from our students attending the preparatory, cor preparatory course for medicine. And again, communication skills, knowledge, time management. So we need new explanations. We need new values for this professionalism. And then Frederick Hufferty, who usually attends 
AMI conferences, at a certain moment wrote a very famous paper when he said, well, it's all within medical profession. Even when we know it's not working, the medical profession is faulty, let's say, but still these are doctors who call doctors for doctors. And this is not about doctors, it's about patients. And this was a huge change. And these are not doctors who should tell what are the qualities of the best doctor. These are patients who should say it. And then a new framework started developing. This is, you may know this CANMED's framework, who very practically explains how professional doctors, what are the features, what are the competencies, what are the roles of professional doctors. And now you can see that previously, in fact, we're only teaching this medical expertise. And now you see all those petals of the flowers, professional communicator, collaborator, and so on and so on. And this model is being upgraded every few years. So this is the latest one when the manager was replaced with the term leader. And again, this is for not only one day, this is for a week of workshops about this model when professional, petal of professional, the role of professional includes also the ability to care about our own health, about our own well-being. So I told you about self-regulation. And this is changing. This is changing towards shared regulation. And we differ very much between countries. So for some countries, uh, we still believe that doctors should decide about doctors. For example, for UK, on General Medical Council, there are more not doctors than doctors. Because people believe we have the right to tell what are the doctors that we expect. Again, this is a very uh, paradigmatic shift and doctors are very resistant to this because you know it's it's very difficult to tell to to admit that someone should advise me how i should work so the question is can we really teach people to be professional and the answer is yes we know quite a lot about how students learn to be professionals how we should teach and how we should assess it i'm not sure how absolutely obvious for you it is so i'm sorry i will just show you um, very shortly, there is a declared curriculum. So for example, the teacher is coming and uh, presenting you a lecture on let's say cervical cancer. Uh, and these are the slides. The taught curriculum is what this teacher really tells you. Like for example, and yesterday we had a very special case. This was about this and this and this. It was not in a declared curriculum, but this is the teaching. But the problem is, that students learn a lot, even I would say more of what, not, of what was not declared and explicitly taught. It's so-called hidden curriculum. So this is about how the teacher or doctor was behaving, how the teacher was speaking about patients, whether the teacher was on time, whether the teacher was polite and communicative, and this is for you as future teachers. This is one of the three questions I got. So one of the most fundamental things you need to realize that you will not only become the teacher of surgery, the teacher of pathology, you will become the role model. So you will, and, uh, you will most probably learn more from how you behave than from what you say. That's why we stop believing that lectures are so important. And we believe that it's much more important to work with students in a real uh, work environment to be mentors for the students. And unfortunately, the role modeling can be positive, but also negative. And we have a lot of examples. I can give you one of the examples. This is a very famous example, hand washing. This is from the paper by Charlotte Rees. So what they checked, uh, you know, um, that especially now in the COVID era, I think now we totally change attitudes towards hand washing. But even a year ago, there was a doctor showing students how to wash hands. And perhaps you have even this moment when they teach you how to properly surgically wash hands, how you should do this and so on and so on. But then students were observing the same doctors not washing hands when approaching patients, not washing hands after examining the patient. And this was the mixed message. There was a tension between what this doctor was explicitly teaching 
and what this doctor was exp what, what this doctor was showing how do you think I, i'm sure you know it uh, uh, what do students learn do they learn what they taught them during the lecture or do they learn what they see of course they learn what they see so this hidden message was you may and is sometimes you may become a doctor without following the professional values the problem another problem is that it's not enough to recognize that someone is not professional because look if you can i'm sure you can tell about fantastic teachers but you can also easily say well this teacher is not a good teacher because of this and this and this it doesn't make you a good teacher in the future unfortunately because people observe people are critical and people become as these bad role models are so as you see it's a very complex uh, it's a very complex process but we know that you need support from your teachers to discuss all professional lapses and uh, the only thing to contradict that kind of situations is not to avoid the discussion uh, it's again another workshop we might have for a few hours about dealing with medical errors but traditionally we are trying not to show students any medical errors so you are going through education believing that doctors do not commit errors no doctors commit errors of course and then no one taught you how to deal with them doctor commit professional lapses so instead of pretending that students should not see this doctor being rude to patient or disrespectful your teacher should invite you to discuss it what have you seen how do you think why did it happen how to avoid it how to react this is how we can teach and practice medical professionalism so definitely professionalism should be taught and should be taught also uh, we need to start from theoretical foundation because you need to understand what professional is we need to be very respectful towards all cultures if we have time i will tell you about different approaches to professionalism but we need to teach it so look at first we need to explain what professionalism means what is the definition what are the features just to allow you to like open your minds and understand all the concept and then you need to start to see interact with all the dilemmas in the workplace environment so one of the things so it's back for a moment to this slide so we have a very well structured course uh, program for professionalism on, uh, at our university we start from really first days of the first academic year and then through years we go through more clinical modules we go through modules on this anti-discrimination strategies uh, in medical education what you may know from my previous meeting we have a more meetings we have a module on cultural competence and cultural dilemmas of um, uh, professionalism and we are very happy to share it with colleagues from around the world so one of the things we start our courses from is discussing professionalism and lifestyle and look this is the quote we show our students this is from the GMC the UK document students must be aware of their behaviors outside the clinical environment including their personal lives may have an impact on their fitness to practice which means that they may not get the license to work Riga, because of the problems with their behavior outside the clinical environment i don't see your faces at the moment but even if your faces are just smiling i think there are some people who say no 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 why should you interfere with my private life because historically we were only taking care of how students behave at the hospital but now we are aware that the doctors can see us outside the hospital so doctors can see i'm sorry patients patients can see their doctor in the city misbehaving they may know that uh, their doctor is drinking and driving or abusing substance and it doesn't matter it's not at the clinical environment who of you having a baby would agree that a doctor will perform 
a surgery on your baby if you can see the same doctor drunk in the street or if you see posts from this doctor on Facebook or Twitter uh, including racist content or any other um, abusive content. So we talk a lot with the students and we may discuss it when, when I stop talking, if you have any questions regarding uh, this. We talk a lot, we have a special module on students and social media and we discuss what is allowed, what is not allowed and please remember this definition, it's all about trust. What you publish on social media directly influences if the patients will trust you. And don't tell that this is interference with your private life because this is your free will to publish it. No one is interfering what you do at home with what you do at home. Although it's a very interesting question. For example, you being students, what is the moment you should start reacting knowing that your colleague is, for example, addicted to alcohol or addicted to drugs? Shall you wait till your colleague comes drunk to the classes? If this happens, most probably it's, it's too late. Most probably this is the end of the career of this person. If you react much earlier, you may help this person and this person maybe in the future will become the perfect doctor. So what we see that students struggle very often is this transmission from being a professional student to becoming a professional doctor. This is especially difficult for students who uh, are attending not integrated programs. So if your first three years of studies are absolutely um, or with very limited access to patients and you just have chemistry, microbiology and so on and so on, then you suddenly switch to medical courses and uh, what we can hear very often from students who uh, commit a professional lapse, they say, oh, please understand, I'm a student. I would never do this being a doctor. I will never do this being a doctor. And you know, this is not the truth because we also do research uh, which is based on analysis of what happened previously. Do you think that if a doctor comes drunk to the night shift, do you think this is the first time of this, of when this doctor started drinking? Or do you think this doctor started drinking years ago and no one was reacting till this doctor came drunk to the hospital? Do you think that someone who falsified, forged, committed plagiarism, excuse me, uh, writing their PhD th thesis, do you think it happened for the first time? Or do you think this student starting committing micro-plagiarism, micro-cheating uh, during uh, their studies. So that's why, by the way, we are changing now approach to identifying professional lapses. Previously, schools were mostly focused on major professional lapses. Student expresses racist behavior. Student comes drunk to the clinical environment. And now we know that it's too late. And now we try to focus on micro-professional lapses because if we identify, if we can, if the student has a mentor and if we can identify that this student was late for this class and was cheating during this exam and did something and, and perhaps committed, may, we wouldn't call it a plagiarism, but not properly, didn't reference properly their work. If there is a person who starts combining it, then this person says, okay, this is the person that needs intervention. This person needs remediation. And if we help this person early enough, this person may become a professional doctor in the future. Otherwise, if we wait till major professional labs, we'll say, okay, you cannot become a doctor. This is the end of your career. So we see this tension and students very often believe that they will become professional doctors. Like 
and many of you may be very religious, many of you may be not religious, but you know, smiling, we may say it's like, I'm not a professional student, I drink, I put on social media, whatever, whatever. And then during graduation, the heavens open and the Holy Spirit changes us into professional doctor. No, the Holy Spirit doesn't work that way. So we need to work on this to help students to slowly but effectively change from very young and not fully professional to professional doctors. Um, now I think I need to be very unprofessional in this. Uh, I mean, I just will uh, look at my slides and I will see because I don't want to speak for too long. So we, we know how to examine it, how to assess it, and I can tell you about this. We know how to do the research. I will let me, I will, uh, can you still see my screen, guys? I'm not sure. Yes, we no. can. Oh, okay, so. Oh, no. We'll, no? I'm only know. seeing you, Anush, and a lot of our fellow students, but not your screen anymore. Okay, I will try to, I just want to show you only a few slides, so. Okay, this slide is yes. showing the results. Yes, the, it's back. Is it okay or no? Yes. Yes. Okay, so this, the arrows, show the research we're presenting at Amy that shows that there is a problem that students see like two types of doctors. They see that either you are a very competent, technically perfect, knowledgeable doctor, or you are a caring, empathetic, understanding, culturally aware and humble doctor. So there is the problem that you sort of see that you can go two directions. You majority of people don't see that this is just one way that we need both options. Uh, this is a really interesting picture because this is one of the drawings. Uh, you can see that this is the battle, that there are battleships at the bottom and there is a castle at the top. And you can see that the battleship is uh, entitled academic professionalism and the castle is entitled medical professionalism. So as you can see, one of our students sees it at a very serious battle and fight to transform from academic to medical professionalism. I'm showing, of course, these uh, pictures with the permissions of the students. And by the way, they were published. If you want to see this, um, if you want to see the, uh, this, to read this research, I will be happy to share the uh, resources with you, uh, references. So look, the problem, another problem is that currently we have separate discussions on professionalism sort of like nurses have separate professionalism, pharmaceutical professionals have their own professionalism and patients don't need it. Patients need health workforce professionalism. Patients, from the patient perspective, they don't want doctors blaming nurses and nurses blaming doctors and so on and so on. They want all people to be, to be focused on patients well-being and patient safety. And uh, I think this will be the last slide I will show you. It's, we need to remember, and this is emphasized by multiple resources, that medical professionalism is very strongly related to local cultures. Because we differ in, you may, you may remember this slide from my previous presentation for IFMSA. You may uh, remember that we differ in communication, diet, religions, lifestyles, and even um, our patients, and not even, and our patients differ. It's not that we moved from not educated patients to educated patients. No, we will deal, you will deal with rich people, poor people, minority people, people who are on all the possible spectrums of uh, education, and you need to know how to professionally treat this patient, patients. How do you make the person on the, on the left trust you? And how do you make people on the right to trust you? And this is a question just showing a very basic difference 
Should doctors provide medical care for their families? And you know, for many countries, this is absolutely unacceptable that a husband or a wife or mom treat their family. For many countries, this is absolutely a norm. So you may also imagine how difficult it is to teach medical professionalism to international students when in one group, I'm every day I'm working with a cohort of students just like you, which is fantastic. But we are teaching students professionally from all the world and we need to, we cannot teach you how to be professional in your country, but we are doing our best to teach you how to understand your professional values, how to understand professional values of our people, and then to become professionals. Okay, as you can see, this was very, and still it was much too long, uh, but I wanted to see you, to, to show you how complex it is. So I'm absolutely happy if you ask the questions that you like now. So, um, yes, thank you, Anish, for this uh, great short uh, intro. And uh, the chat box was pretty busy with other topics, Sue, so you inspired a discussion there. Um, people, maybe uh, post an I or your question directly in the chat box. And I also have a question for you, Janusz, because I was thinking about what you said about monitoring the, the micro um, professionalism Lapses. like signs. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what got me thinking directly was in my university, there's almost no class that has a personal relation to the teachers. And um, there are just a few classes that are taught in small groups where you can actually see what people are doing. So um, do you have any approach to how to I have approach, but I need to ask you, can we make a one second break, okay? Just one second. I will explain you why in a moment. Okay, we are just having such a heavy rain that I couldn't, I, I had to close the balcony because I just couldn't hear you. Uh, okay, so what is the, now I could hear everything, but what is the question at the end? Yes, so my question in the end was, uh, do you have an approach to how uh, it can be monitored properly, no. the professional okay, so, students, um, when it's a big group, so you don't, ca you can't uh, ensure um, small group teaching? This is very complex, uh, but we know how to do this. So one magical word is uh, mentoring, which means that for many schools, students are uh, at the beginning of their studies, they are assigned to a person that we call, I know that you know mentoring, but just let me finish the sentence. They are assigned either to, to a mentor uh, because they identify a mentor, or sometimes these are so-called arranged marriages that the school just assigns you to the teacher. This should be the teacher that is not directly teaching you, or especially not the teacher of a major, serious, large course, because then you are not really, you don't have the good relation because you, you have the relation with your assessor. So, um, and then this teacher, and there are many strategies, uh, you should write a contract with your mentor. We will meet once a month or we will meet online or there are many options. And now, um, maybe there are some people, for example, from Maastricht, that they would know it. What does it mean, programmatic assessment? Look, for majority of schools, people fail an academic year because they failed a major exam. And uh, what we should do is, instead of this, we should constantly observe the student and we should observe that the student starts having, um, I just don't want to, because we don't have that much time, I, I might find the slide. Uh, so instead of failing the student on a major exam, we may make a specific structure of so-called programmatic assessment when this mentor has access to all your results of small formative assessment and to all documents regarding your professional lapses. And then we may identify, okay, this person starts having problems. So we need to implement some, as I said, intervention. 
uh, an opposite. We are not that worried if a really good student suddenly fails an exam. Because, I mean, we are worried, but not from the academic perspective. Perhaps this person has some issues that needs to be supported. If the person didn't stop learning, maybe this person has health issues, maybe this person has family issues. So this person, let's stop worrying about this person failing one exam. Let's think how to help this person to overcome this program, to this problem. So both in assessment and by assessment, I don't mean only anatomy course. I mean also some, some of all your professional behaviors that goes into a special document, maybe online document, when your mentor can access it and your mentor can discuss, do you need, you know, I'm, I'm so happy after that kind of interventions when the students starts having, uh, I really feel it's much, uh, I, I really feel much more proud after the situation when we can help one student and identify the problems than after the most uh, important lecture on the international conference. We, I could, I could tell you so many stories of students that were struggling with teaching and all the teachers were saying, this is the poor student, we should get rid of this student. And that we could identify that, for example, this student had depression. And instead of getting rid of the student, we are helping the student. We are just sending the student to a good counseling. And next year, the student was coming back as a perfect student and was saying, thank you so much. I will become a doctor. So, uh, so Philippa, this is, this is very difficult because it requires this mentoring structure and this requires this programmatic approach to, to students. There should be a person that you should trust enough to tell not only that you have problems with teaching, but also to tell why you have problems with teaching. So if you come to me, I will not become your therapist because it's not my role, but I will tell you how to go to therapist. Where is the therapist? Or maybe how to solve your issues. And one of the, you know, one of the um, hints I give to students, uh, I think I was talking about this uh, for a moment during the previous webinar, is instead of struggling and trying to keep up with learning, perhaps it is much better to take a short break, maybe to take a leave, to fix your health issues, to fix your personal issues, and be back to school fully ready to learn again. Because if you try to do everything, you will fail with everything. So, okay, I, perhaps I'm answering for too long for your short question. Guys, what are the other questions? No problem, it's a good one. Uh, actually, there's some side discussion on the uh, Matt Bikini uh, scandal on Twitter here. Uh, I don't know whether you know it, Janusz, uh, but I was just thinking um, of another question uh, or something you just said that uh, brought me to the, to the things and the sentence behind on you, which is leave no one behind. I think it's a really different approach of Matt schools because some try to actively sort out students, also academically, to put them under a lot of pressure and identifying students who, like what is the reason for being bad and to actually uh, tackle it, to uh, take the students until the end of the class is a whole, like there's miles apart from these two approaches. And I think a problem is that a lot of schools are still stuck on that side of uh, how to deal with students. This is... Um, yeah, but does anyone have a question? Yeah, no, sure. I think there are three raised hands, Philippa. Oh, sorry, I kind of, I was on the wrong form or my, like, um, I'm not with the moderator, actually. That's the problem, probably. Lubna, can you see them? Well, I'm, I'm one of them. Can I ask my question? Yes, please speak. And do okay. uh, just post an I in the chat box then, maybe. Sorry. Um, so uh, I have two questions, Professor. The first one is, we know that it's hard to do faculty development. 
And uh, what are you, your insights about uh, doing faculty development on professionalism so the, their professors are professional during their clinical rounds? And uh, the second question would be, uh, we can teach attitudes, but um, like, um, I, I'm, I'm, maybe this is a controversial um, thing, but do we, should, should we analyze our profile of students when they are entering university to evaluate their attitudes or rather than teaching them during their course? Uh. Okay, so uh, I'm smile. You will understand why I'm smiling in a moment. First of all, faculty development is absolutely necessary because teachers don't know. I'm sorry, but there are many traditional schools, many traditional teachers. So you cannot teach something you don't realize that exists. So we do a lot of faculty development just to to create the awareness of hidden curriculum, to create the awareness that really. But you know what? I usually ask when I, I do faculty development. And then when I discuss this issue, I ask teachers, uh, who of you have schools about seven, eight years of age and people raise hands and I say, when your kid comes back from school, uh, do your kids tell you about the content of the class on mathematics or do your kids tell you how the teacher was behaving, how the teacher was dressed and so on and so on. So how many percent do they teach about, tell you about this? How many percent about this? 99% is about the teacher. So this is 99% what your kid is learning. So now be aware that you are a teacher at every moment. And uh, now the second question, I, I was smiling first of all, because it's a very basic question that every student, because I know you feel your personal freedom is being restricted. And this is very difficult, uh, but there are multiple approaches to this. So um, I was, uh, the first approach will be a little bit harsh. There are many interesting jobs, occupations, which do not require you to develop trust of the other people. And I always give an example in Poland, so Sebastian knows it. We had, a, uh, we had a very famous uh, painter who was, uh, mm, who was uh, addicted to everything. And he was even a marking, if you wanted the portrait from this person, you might tell, okay, I want you to drink or to uh, smoke, smoke marijuana and so on and so on. And now every famous museum has pictures from this painter with description, it was, under influence of this and this. And no one is questioning the artistic value. So, uh, but this was an artist and you will not say, I will not buy a picture painted by this artist because this artist is addicted to alcohol, but you will not go to the doctor who is addicted to alcohol. And from real life, my colleague, she really always loved partying. And then she became a teacher and students loved her, but she still loved partying. And she was meeting her students. And, and by partying, I mean, how to say it? A little bit hardcore partying, okay? If you know what I mean. So I didn't mean just going to have one glass of wine in the city. So she was meeting her students and it didn't work. And she really was a fantastic teacher but she decided that she will stop teaching because she's not going to change her private life. And she's now writing books for school children. So uh, this is an example that if you really feel that this is too restricting, because there is another problem, how much you can play two roles, how much you can pretend at work that you are different from you are in your private life. And I, I, took a part in a, I took part in a really interesting workshop for people who teach professionalism. And I can tell you that um, we were this discussion, we, we had this discussion. Uh, do you separate? Is it possible? I can tell, no, it is not possible to really separate it. So either you accept that you are under observation uh, or perhaps you are not 
the right person. I just don't want to sound uh, too harsh, but you, you, you may have the mindset that is good for many other professions, but maybe not for medical profession that the mother needs to trust you to give her small baby into your hands. So how much the school can, again, we are not, if you um, just, um, as, you, as you mentioned, uh, uh, hashtag my bikini and so on and so on. Uh, I'm not, again, I'm not sure if you have experienced something like this. You tell your friend, oh, I could see on your Instagram that you have a new boyfriend. And they tell you, oh, you are spying on me. No, I'm not spying on you. You publish it and everyone around the world can see this. This is not spying. You might say I'm spying if I leave my, uh, I don't know, hidden microphone in your room. So I don't agree when you say that it's interference with your private life. If someone looks at your Instagram profile, Twitter, TikTok, and so on and so on. No, because no one forces you to show such pictures. And generally this discussion about med bikini and everything around it, this is really interesting. We need to remember that now we are living in a globalized society, world, and we have patients from different cultures. So something totally, because we may say, what is acceptable for an MD? And if I tell you, is it acceptable for a doctor to post pictures in a, a you call it lingerie, in a, you know, private underwear in a sleeping room, perhaps all, everyone would say no. Is it acceptable to post pictures from the holidays in Thailand in uh, swimwear? Perhaps majority would say yes, but you know how much swim, swimwear differs, yes? So again, it becomes more complex because I would say previously it was much more easy because Polish doctor was treating just Polish patients. So we exactly know what is acceptable and what's not acceptable for our patients. But um, I think we should... There's a question touching a bit on this. Maybe it's a little bit specific, but for Michelle from Hong Kong uh, about dyeing your hair, for instance. Um, Michelle, do you want to just, just quickly tell Janusz a question? Yeah, so my question is because um, in different countries, um, some people may say it is unacceptable to dye your hair. And I'm just wondering um, how professionalism plays into that. So is it because of uh, like, if it's an outrageous color that's unprofessional, what if it's just uh, a brown or like it becomes blonde if you're not like an original blonde? Um, and what if it becomes more relatable to other patients who also dye their hair? So what does professionalism play into uh, such a situation? I will answer a question. I just want to say, to finish the, the previous thread is that we had a sort of funny and nice moment in one of our courses uh, when one of the students during that kind of discussion was very much against any interference with the life outside the university. And he was, I would say, on the edge of being aggressive. And uh, at the end of this course, uh, uh, he said that he wants to apologize because he understands, he wants to explain why he was so aggressive. Because no one told him before he decided to become a medical student that this is one of the dimensions of being a doctor and medical student. And now during this course, he started realizing that he needs to change his life. And this is quite difficult to admit that you need to change life. And this is the truth that usually when you join medicine, medical studies, people will tell you, oh, this is so difficult, you need to learn a lot, but no one tells you, you need to become a professional doctor. About dyeing your hair, I think it is uh, the question no one will answer you because it's very culturally specific. So this is so, because it's the same discussion as about, for example, wearing a hair, headscarf, yes? So for some countries, this is, uh, mm, because there are many people who look at, uh, a scarf, this is something, um, this is not only religious, I'm uh, sorry, I just, this is too, too long to, to go too deep into this. This is about personal modesty. For some people, for some women, this is just modest to wear a headscarf, yes? For some, it is not necessary. So uh, the same about dyeing hair. I cannot tell, 
my advice is always think about your patients. So let's, you, you, you gave a really like mild example, dyeing hair to, hair to blonde and so on. Let's talk about dyeing hair to pink. So the question, which personally, I think it's fun. I don't have, I, but you know, I'm an educated person and I don't think that if my doctor has her in pink color or earrings and so on, I don't think it, it is connected to uh, the qualities of the doctor. But think about your patient who may be from a small town, not educated, older person. What if you come to this person with pink hair? And then your decision was to become a doctor and you want the person to trust you. So this is sort of, I would say, your own judgment. This is your own judgment. Uh, we had that kind, I'm not sure if I should tell it in public, but, I'm, but I will tell because it's about my institution. But we had this controversial moment when there was a Polish student, a girl, and there was a male student from one of the Arab countries. And this student referred to the, to our Polish uh, girl student. And he said that she's wearing not modest clothes. And honestly, the first reaction was very much against the Muslim student. How can the person who is not from our country criticize the person that is not, that is Polish? But I said, just, hello, wait a moment. And maybe let's try to be honest. Let's look if this was really the proper attire to approach patients or no, because perhaps mini dress and high heels are perfect for the party are perfect for the club, but are not really perfect if the doctor is just, uh, if you can see the belly of the doctor because the t-shirt is that short. So perhaps for the patients, it's not appropriate. So, so no answer for this. You need to answer this question from the perspective, will this affect how your patient, I think it may be opposite. I think if you work with some minorities, refugees, poor people, perhaps it's not the best idea to come in a very expensive suit and gold watch. You might say I'm perfectly dressed, okay, but for these people you create such a distance that they will not communicate with you and they would prefer you to be dressed, of course, in a clean but much more plain clothes. Arwa, I can see your raised hand. I can, I'm not sure if you can hear you, just. Can you hear me? It's low. It's very, it's, okay, it's very, very quiet. Oh, it's very, okay, can you hear me now? It's the same if you can like talk louder or closer to the mic. Okay, I'll try and talk louder. Can you hear me better? Yeah. Okay, I wanted to share something in that context, uh, in the context of how culture uh, affects how doctors should live their lives. Uh, in, rural, in Sudan in general and in rural area, areas, um, psychiatric, uh, psychiatrists and these type of doctors are not very accepted. So um, we have this doctor who had this approach where generally in rural areas, um, they trust um, traditional healers and these type of people. So he has this approach where he has, um, when um, his clinic, he has a small room where he puts a traditional healer and um, he's in this, like the, the room next to it. So basically he just, um, he, he has a traditional healer as an introduction for them to um, accept the psychiatric help and, and stuff. So it has been really successful and very interesting approach for it to be, uh, to be done. So currently it, it is very, again, it's, it's a really interesting issue. We stopped calling traditional medicine alternative medicine. We call it traditional medicine or we call it complementary medicine because sometimes it's very helpful because it provides people with some safety. And I look at traditional medicine from this perspective. If there is a person, let's say there is a woman uh, visiting an oncologist and this oncologist diagnoses this woman with breast cancer and does not give proper support explanation, but offers chemotherapy this woman is absolutely 
stressed, devastated. What happens? She stops visiting doctor. She goes to the healer. And you know what the healer provides her with? Understanding. The problem is that healer will not help her because the healer don't, doesn't know how to properly teach cancer. But whose fault it is? It's really fault of the doctor who could not provide the patient with trust. So this is, if there is a moment when patient chooses traditional medicine, this is the moment when the, uh, I avoid telling Western medicine because some clever people corrected me that it is not really Western because it comes from Avicenna and so on and so on. So contemporary medicine doctor should reflect why do they choose uh, healers because they are not afraid of healers because healers are respectful sometimes unfortunately healers can do harm because of their treatment but we need to learn how can we provide that same kind of feeling of safety and so on so thank you for bringing this back because i think we should uh, i know i'm not sure if we have people from china here but in china there is a big difference between um the approach of uh, modern medicine and traditional medicine to communication with family, because in, 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 in this area, very often the family wants to know first what is the diagnosis for the contemporary European American medicine, it's the patient who should know best. But then sometimes people choose traditional medicine only because of that kind of tension. So you need to learn how to solve this tension. So it was, it was thank you for pointing it as for bringing this to the discussion. Okay, uh, do we have time for another question, Janusz, or? Yes, I, of course. Uh, there was one by Moksheda. I don't know whether you can talk, Moksheda. It was about like being politically engaged. I think it was very interesting. Moksheda? Ah, she, she can, can okay um, yes i will just read it so um she wrote down how professional is it for doctors to refuse to see patients when they protest health policies in my country india when you want something from the government you strike along with labor unions this is inherently against a bureaucratic oath we have taken that's what she wrote perhaps this is i don't know exactly the context but i would say our first and almost only obligation is to help patients and to to provide patients with help. So I think that in case of doctors, I think uh, if I may relate maybe to the German situation, I it made you think of it is that uh, if doctors they do a lot of over hours, a lot of over shifts, and there is basically no way usually to tackle this is to go on a uh, strike. But uh, in health policy, you always have the problem that if you don't attend and you do want to make it better because your overtired doctor is not good for your patients either. But um, going on strike means that you won't go to your shift and you may not be able to treat some patients. So it's like an inherent conflict. And I think that uh, in context to professionalism is the question now. <laughs> Well, but I think, I it, it, yes, Kevin, your cat is really cute. And now I feel like, come on, I want to show you my cat. But what's the name of your cat, Kevin? Tell us. Uh, my cat is Mr. Tickles. OK, Mr. Tickles. My cat is called Ponyo, but I'm not sure if she'll come. So, uh, but I, I still think that at this level of information I, I, I have, I would say that I cannot imagine that the doctor does not help the patient. I can imagine that there are many strategies we can we can employ uh, to show our dissatisfaction but providing the patient's care this is it is also related to mm, what i started to talk to you sort of in private oh, this is a really big 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 cut wow it's cute it's almost nine kilos oh god so um it's, it's also related to this discourse, how much we should protect now students against COVID uh, in case of uh, your medical studies, but you are going to become doctors and you cannot refuse to treat patients only because they are uh, infected with COVID, yes? So 
Um, I know it may be just a big parallel, but I still believe that our first duty is to provide patients with appropriate treatment. The second, uh, and then after, if we are sure that we provide patients with the proper treatment and care, then we can think about how to protest. Can I add something on that? Yes. Yeah, uh, also I think what Makshada was talking about, for example, now in Peru, uh, last year medical students, which are the, the interns, don't have uh, labor rights. So they, they, are, they are in pay, they, they don't have protective uh, equipment and so on. And also doctors now during this pandemic have been into strike because they haven't received any payment or or even they they are left without a uh, protective equipment so so the question is more related to that so how professional it can be for a doctor to to protest for their rights the 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 the, the health system should ensure to them in uh, uh, before treating a patient in that moment for example but I think when you say protest, I think it's, we have the right to protest, absolutely. Uh, there is a, you, 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 some of you, I, I don't know why, but the difference between cultures and regions, for some people, the term altruism is very obvious, for some you don't know it. So altruism, when we uh, put someone else's health and benefit over our own. So this understanding of what altruism mean, means changes through years because historically an altruist doctor was the doctor, let's say there is a pandemic and the doctor is without any protection, is entering the area of pandemics, is entering the area of Ebola, helping a few people dies and they build you a monument. But you didn't help many people, you died and what? And now we know that altruism is to first protect ourselves because we need to help the other people and then we may help thousands of people so of course we we are absolutely entitled and this is in many you know this differs again um, i i really appreciate countries that have very specific professional regulations which say for example that if any patient poses a threat for a doctor you may refuse treating this patient but at the same moment you need to call special services that are trained to treat that kind of the patient. But of course, this, is, this does not apply to every country. We, not every country has such a perfect uh, strategy, but we have the right to protect ourselves. And this is another very interesting issue. And we have um, <clears throat> part of the module with our students on patient's aggression, by the way, because we want to understand doctors that patients are not aggressive because they are inherently evil. People are remember, remind when was the last time you became aggressive? It was when you were stressed or in pain or did not get the service that you wanted to get or you were just frightened. So we are trying, instead of telling patient doctors, if the patient is aggressive, call the police, we are teaching our students how to avoid situation when the patient becomes aggressive and how to identify the situation before the patient becomes aggressive. Uh, so, but again, we have the right for the safety and we need to protect, protest if we don't get the appropriate support in this. So Andres, you, I, I believe we, we need to uh, be vocal about our rights. Okay, I'm gonna go just because, okay. Okay, so um, this, um, Kevin here from Honduras. Mm -hmm. So there was this side conversation happening on the chat box about this paper where, you know, three male doctors analyzed some Facebook profiles, Instagram profiles, and they uh, decide what was unprofessional or what was professional behavior on a social media. And my question, or and I think a lot of us uh, are questioning this, it's who decide what's professional and unprofessional. And you kind of said before that you, you can do the call yourself. Okay, so I decide that this behavior is 
not unprofessional because it's in my private social media, whatever. Uh, but then the other people who's around who are from all over the world can decide from themselves if that behavior was professional or not professional. Uh, specifically talking about what about a picture having a beer? Is that unprofessional having one beer? What's the difference between one and three or six? Um, about having a bikini, having a micro bikini, what's the difference between having one piece or two pieces? Or wearing a shirt, like for example, me, I'm just wearing a shirt right now that says Refugees Welcome, which is a pro refugees uh, shirt that will be unprofessional, maybe where there's a refugees crisis like Turkey or Mexico. Um, and just to like put those like contexts that go, no, sorry, that goes beyond like our own like local patients, because maybe here they'll be acceptable, but a few miles further, they might not be acceptable. Uh, so I guess that's kind of tricky when you're, especially when you're a student, you're exposed to all this and you don't really know what you just like dead or publish or, or say. Um, and then so the other one was uh, just, you talk a little bit about the micro. Uh, professional lapses. Micro. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So also who decide that? Like, again, coming to the alcoholism, it's having one beer that might indicate that you might like alcohol and become an alcoholism. Or it's having a drug that is legal in that location, but then in your country it's illegal. Mm -hmm. Is that unprofessional because you had it in a place where it was legal or something like that? So uh, currently, usually we have national regulations. And as I told you, profession needs to have this professional organization and code of ethics. Codes of ethics differ very much between countries. For some countries, they are still based on those nostalgic values. And then it's not helpful because it doesn't help to tell you you need to be altruist and uh, um, excellent because you ask very particular questions. But again, I'm not saying that UK is the best example, but I just know this context. So if you enter the GMC internet uh, site, you will find answers for many of that kind, let's say micro questions. Like for example, there is an answer to the question, if you, I am a family doctor, I'm visiting my patient and I like my patient's brother and sister, can I use that kind of professional relation to ask this person for a date? Or no, and now it's, I'm not telling you whether you can or no, because it differs between countries, but there are many countries that have that detailed codes. And also this is what, in my opinion, we should aim at that the professional bodies are not only composed of doctors, because again, we are now in, then in a closed box, but if the professional body, if the disciplinary committee includes representative of patients in the society, then they are, those people who should say uh, who should say what is allowed and not allowed. When you said about your t-shirt, which might be appropriate here and there, uh, if you live in a quite international community, I think it is always, if you are not sure, I'm sorry to say this, but it's better to avoid it. Because this may be something, as you said, may be perfect for your country, and maybe offensive for the other. And for micro professional lapses, for example, for my school, but this is something new, we are just, but it already exists. We have the disciplinary committee, which is for the serious lapses, but we have also the ethical committee, which is when we see that the student has problems, maybe needs support, but this is not for the disciplinary committee just to uh, remove the student from the university. So, there are specific committees at schools and this is, you should search for that kind of papers. You should show it to your schools. You should encourage your teachers to do this. This is your role if you learn something new. Okay, thank you, uh, Janusz. I think uh, maybe there we have one time for one last question. Yes, do you agree? <laughs> okay. uh, I think Natasha, Sasha uh, said she had something related to the direction we were going to shoot, please. Oh yeah, that was a couple of questions ago. But um, okay, so a bit of background. I'm, uh, I'm a medical intern in Jordan. And over the past couple of years as a medical student, and even now as a medical intern, uh, we had, 
I've had patients uh, sometimes refuse to be seen by me or examined by me for lots of reasons. Sometimes because uh, they don't uh, uh, trust medical students, they only want junior doctors or specialists seeing them. Sometimes because I'm a female, sometimes it's a modesty reason, whatever the reason is. Um, and a lot of the times specialists were called to intervene and they all had very different ways of dealing with it. Some of them told the, the patients that this is not acceptable, this is a teaching hospital, this is hospital, uh, they're here to do their job, etc., etc. And at other times they really, I mean, they told the patient, we see your point of view, uh, it's fine, we'll tell her to go outside, uh, to go outside and not examine you and go into the hallway. So I was just th uh, thinking that it's kind of hypocritical, hypocritical of doctors to, act, to behave in this way. Since, I mean, if, if, if they let patients refuse to, uh, refuse to be examined by us, isn't that kind of hypocritical? It, I thought that like after I finished med school, I would see the situation less and less, but honestly, it's just the same as a medical uh, intern. So I was just asking, like, is, is there a way for, is there a policy or is there anything um, for the medical faculty or the hospital to intervene, like to do in this situation? Is there like a, a stance that they should take in support of their doctors? Um. I think, first of all, you should check for the local regulations on this. For Poland, if the patient is at the medical university, at the clinical hospital, they automatically agree that students are around, but they do not need to agree that students examine them. And at least I'm very strict about this to tell all the teachers and to remind all the teachers. The fact that our patient is at the clinical hospital doesn't mean that they need to, that the woman needs to allow the students to, for example, perform gynecological examination. So I always look from the patient's perspective and I will be always uh, on the patient's side despite being a doctor. Um, if there is a woman that prefers her doctor to be a woman, if there is only such an option, I would provide her with a woman doctor. Sometimes there is no option, but then usually this is something we can, we can somehow solve. But uh, you, need to be, you need to verify because I cannot promise that for your university or for your country, you know what, there is a set of documents the patients sign when they are admitted to the hospital. And this usually includes the very important paragraph about relations with students. So I think you need to verify it. What do they sign? Because if they sign, that yes, I agree that I can be, uh, I agree to be investigated, examined by patients, then it's a complex issue. Then the patient really, then maybe you should do something to change this policy. But if the patient signs it, maybe they are not aware of this. Maybe um, yes, exactly. They do sign paperwork that say, because in Jordan, as a medical intern, you're kind of still like a practicing student. So it's the same thing when they sign the paperwork. But I don't see like doctors or a medical faculty or whatever take a stance on this. Like they don't enforce this at all. So it, and this happens a lot. So like, how can we learn if medical students go uh, go into their sixth year or finish med school, and they've never performed an, uh, a gynecological exam? Uh, well, there is uh, there is also middle of the way because I know not every school can afford it. But now there is such a fantastic, uh, there is such a fantastic simulation, uh, simulators. I'm, I'm just thinking about our students who learn um, delivery, how to help women to deliver a baby uh, using the high fidelity mannequins when they can feel how the cervix is uh, changing, whether the cervix is getting softer and so on and so on. So, but I know it's a financial, it's a huge financial uh, burden for the school. Um, you know, I will, answer you in a little bit general way. Do you remember the CANMETS um, uh, framework and the flower? I told you it changes and it changed one yes. else from manager to leader. What does it mean? It doesn't mean that the doctor is the only leader of the team. It means that you are the change leader. Even being the intern or the youngest resident doctor, you, according to the Canadian framework, you should be able to lead change, to initiate the change. If you think that something is really wrong, you need to be 
vocal you need to understand you need to find the ways how to approach it maybe you should organize a meeting maybe you should organize a workshop maybe you should organize a survey for the doctors maybe you know there are very often uh, many ways we don't realize that will help till we don't ask the question can i do this but again i will not i cannot give you the solution for your hospital i can tell you it's around the world that patients are signing documents not fully aware what what they are signing okay thank you i actually really like that like if uh, we let medical students fill in a survey and see if like this is a problem that's really depriving them of some necessary skills i actually really like that thank you Okay, so um, I see there's still some hands raised, but we are already a little bit over time. Um, not sure how to move forward uh, as okay, we agreed guys, not I, to. Honestly, I, I can still see this. So it was really great to meet you. I hope I will meet you during the conference, during Amy conference, uh, and also maybe during the two WHO sessions that I will be chairing. So uh, first of all, I always that kind of difficult session, I always end with that request. If you don't agree with something I said, if you, because you, I might say something wrong, that is not appropriate for you. If you, you might misunderstand something. So if you feel like there is something I don't agree, please email me and we'll try to solve it. I don't want you to leave this room and to tell, no, he was wrong. I mean, I might be wrong, but then I want to know it and I want to learn, okay? It's very often that our students, these were our students that indicated why at your slides when you show a nurse, you always show a woman. Why when you show a doctor, you always show an, a, a male. And you teach cultural competence. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. So you are so right. So this is just to wrap it up. If anyone wants to stay, I can still stay for 10, 15 minutes and we can still talk. So feel free to disconnect and uh, I hope to meet you in the future. And every question you asked, in fact, was a question for a separate workshop. So if you want to plan for, I know of your organization, something like a cycle, a series of workshops, I can invite my, my colleagues from my department and we can, we can provide it with you. So again, thank you very much. If you want to stay, those people who raised hands, please stay and ask questions. Thank you, Professor. That, that is great. Uh, so we will move on like this. So the uh, webinar is officially over. So I will give an official thank you to Janusz for this very interesting webinar. I hope you have an eye on the chat box, which says a lot of people thanking you uh, and wishing for a next uh, webinar with you. And uh, now the floor is open to open discussion then. <laughs> Professor, would you share with us the reference for the drawings? for the the drawings um about oh, yes. The yes 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 it's really i can tell you so um, i will show you i will share the reference but i will also uh show you something um so i will show you first of all i will show you a few more drawings because this is really nice and we use it's it's another it's another workshop how to use humanities to develop certain qualities of the doctor. We take our students to the Modern Art Museum. Our students make drawings. Our students, uh, for example, now we are doing a research project on draw your stress. Imagine how can you visualize your stress. So um, there are, and we plan to involve students even into making sculptures of, uh, of professionalism. But what I want to show you is, I will share the screen. Okay, no, no, sorry, no, 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 no. I, okay, so uh, we have a lot of these uh, mind maps and we use, can you see my screen now? Yes? Yes, you can. Okay. And we use special software, which is called Atlas TI. This is software for, uh, this is software for, and now we use number eight, but this was used with seven. Atlas TI7. This is a software for qualitative research. And this is the software. It helps us to code it and to extract the knowledge. So for example, after this, we could 
identify what were the main issues according to the students, what were the main themes, and what were the connections, because at these drawings, what was even more interesting than that the text was how you connect it, how you connect something from your studies to something from your academic, uh, to your medical practice. So now I'm searching for the link and I will, it's an open access journal. So you can see a few drawings and you can uh, read it if you like. And I think there are quite a lot of people who are uh, following this approach at the moment and they use, um, they use uh, drawing and mind maps. I have a, at this conference, there will be Dr. Veronica Seliger. And I'm, I'm so sorry because she just decided to retire and uh, because she's absolutely a genius in, in respectful teaching, respectful communication. So her students are drawing their fears for the future. And again, she analyzes this. She even, oh God, now I lost the, I lost the name of the game. Who can tell me the card game when cards have some drawings and you, okay, we are using, yes, 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 yes. So thank you. Who, 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 who said it? Uh, Matilda here. Yeah, thank you. Yes, so we use Dixit for enhancing discussion. We, uh, sometimes when we discuss difficult issues, we, we ask to students, choose one Dixit card that reflects your feelings, show it to your colleague, explain it. So there are many ways to um, encourage people to speak freely. And this is very difficult to find the balance between the freedom of speech and the safety of participants. What we promise from our department, our students, is that of course we need to work within certain limits, but we, teaching professionals, we want your honest discussion. We don't want you to tell us what you think that we could hear. Because if I ask you, uh, do you think that the doctors can drink alcohol and then, uh, no, absolutely. No, we don't need that kind of answer. We want you to honestly tell if you, if you believe they shouldn't, that's okay. But if you believe that they are allowed to drink, uh, tell us honestly. And this differs so much between countries. But I cannot speak about too many things. So what I want to say is, you pro so we promise our students, this is not to tell to your dean, the problem is I'm the dean, but, but then I tell students that we separate this honest discussion. And please, if you do that kind of workshop, this is message from me, but this is the message also from Veronica, I mentioned from the Netherlands, from the Fear Free University in Amsterdam. The same as patient safety is participant safety. At first, you need to be sure that no one will get emotionally hurt. So be very careful if you discuss difficult issues, be very careful. And I discourage people who did not get specific training because sometimes you attend, we attend one workshop. Oh, this is so easy. And then let's make that kind of workshop. But remember that you may uh, face students reacting in a very emotional way. You need to know how to deal it psychologically. So, don't be overly enthusiastic, just learn it first. Then when you are sure that you can deal with this, even for experienced people, I remember this was not my workshop, but I remember uh, a workshop when we were discussing uh, issues of death, which is very important for the students, medical students and doctors. But there was a person who a week ago lost someone very close to this person. And this person had a very emotional, reaction and it was very difficult to provide this person with uh, um, to bring back this person to well-being and balance so just be careful this is so nice that you know dr veronica and i i'm sure that that you agree that she's a really great person guys what are the other questions if there are any yeah i would like to to ask uh, something uh like so before you, you were mentioned about that 
you can teach what you don't know. Uh, so how to start, for example, a lesson in, uh, in my country, generally in my country and, and maybe in some other countries uh, close to Peru, uh, how to start teaching or, or start faculty development in a, in, a, in a health system culture that is based on hierarchy, punishment, social pressure, and those elements. How do, what are your insights or how can we start like basically from, from scratch, you know, to build a professional um, professional culture and and so on. You are giving a very striking example, but with all respect to your example, it's not easy to change people's attitudes even in countries that do not face that kind of problems. And this is very difficult to tell the faculty people who were working particular style to change it. So you, first of all, you always need to think about the outcome. So if you are too aggressive, you will lose this battle. So what you can do is you can give, you can show examples of good practice. You can show these people, for example, the Canvas framework. You can show, you can show, and it applies not only to professionalism, it applies to intercultural competence, it applies to uh, many other domains of medical and health professions education. You may find Amy Guides. Amy Guides are specific booklets published, but it's also in Medical Teacher. Get such a booklet, give it to your faculty. One of the examples, uh, one of the strategies, which I really believe it works, if there is someone who is very much against what you want to do, invite this person to your committee and make this person the member. I know it will be difficult, but after some time, this person will start working with you. Perhaps later on, this person will tell everyone that it was their idea and it was me who invented this, say, okay, let it be, because you did what you, you have achieved what you like. So this is really, uh, do not start from being against someone because then, then you, will, you will absolutely fail. But inviting people, showing people, organizing a meeting, and maybe how they do this at the, in the other schools, and maybe inviting this person and asking this person, would you like to help us, even if you know that this person is totally against this, it may work better than formal protest against something. Okay, thank you, and my apologies if I, if I was like really aggressive. My apologies. No, it's, it's okay. Any more questions? I think people, you know, we have, again, we have a short module about feedback with students, and we always, uh, try to use life, real life examples. If you want your boyfriend or your girlfriend to stop smoking, if you start from yelling at this person, you are stupid or you don't love me and that's why you smoke and so on, this person will tell you, just leave me alone. And perhaps we are not just meant to be together. If you start from explaining this person why this is a problem for you, because if you want to change something, you need to explain why you need it. That if you smoke, you are not only harm your health, but I have difficulties with breathing. I'm coughing, I'm so, and you don't tell this person, stop smoking. You tell this person, can we discuss how we can change the situation? How we can make it a little bit better? I have never smoked in my life, but I can imagine if someone is smoking, this is a serious addiction. So you cannot tell this person, if you love me, stop smoking because this person will tell, I love you, but I, I will not smoke, stop smoking like this. So it is really good to know some leadership strategies, how to give feedback, how to receive feedback, how to work with people. Okay, guys, any more questions? Okay, I think it is, uh, it was really, can I ask Philippa, 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 are you still there? In case you are there, just say it because I, otherwise I will just. 
Uh, I am there actually, but I just quickly need to uh, pop into a store. No, I'm very no, sorry. No, 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 no. But my question is, I want to thank everyone. So, guys, it was really great to meet yes. you. Let's stay in touch. Philippa, do we stay to discuss the other issue or just we we'll switch it to another time? Up to you, just honestly. Because just we need to discuss our project for Amy, but uh, it may be too late for uh, for all of us. So. Okay, I think was for answering our questions and being with all this time, even if it was much later than it was scheduled. Thank you for your time. Thank um, you so much. And thank just listen. So much. Thank you guys and, and let's stay in touch. Bye bye. Good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Bye.